Good evening, everyone. I wanted to make a quick uh, follow-up response video uh, to Thomas. He actually created a, uh, Thomas Lundy, he created a response video for uh, the video series I've been creating, which has been a, a response videos, two response videos, part one and part two, to, uh, with the title, uh, Who Are Christ's True Disciples? And uh, he's created a, a video uh, recently that I wanted to respond to uh, that he created, uh, I guess, his response video for my part two. There are a few things that he brought up I really wanted to address. Uh, I appreciate that he, take, he took the time to create the video, but there are a few points I do want to address um, that he made that I think will be edifying for everyone. But first and foremost, what I want to do is go back to something that I think is important. Because I, I think when you have videos that go back and forth and back and forth, we can some we can sometimes lose perspective. So... I want us to go back to what is the main point of these videos. I know someone, if you're watching these videos, you're probably like, okay, what's the main point? The main point is to address a single question. Who are Christ's true disciples? I know, pretty obvious the title of my videos, right? Uh, and I, I always focused on the verse, John verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 31, where Jesus said, if you abide in my words, you are truly disciples of mine. He's making a qualifying statement. If you meet this condition, meaning the condition of abiding in my word, then you're truly my disciples. So uh, I want to go and I asked, remember, if you've been following along, I asked in the, um, the very first uh, exchange we had, uh, Thomas created a video where he was responding to questions and comments I made on his channel. And I asked him about, is there like a difference between a believer and a disciple? So I want to go back to that video. Okay, I think it's important. There's been a lot that's been said. But I think we need to be focused and go back to what what we, what am I trying to demonstrate through this video? Because I think sometimes we can get in the weeds a little bit. So let me play that quickly. And I'm just going to try to kind of read it fast, and then I'm just going to uh, kind of answer to to what um to what you what you you're saying. Okay, I'm just give you the thoughts that I have. Excuse me. You say this is where the dilemma for me begins when I read scripture without any consideration for doctrines or creeds, just plainly reading the scriptures, just only looking at the testimony of scripture. Okay, great. All right, in John eight thirty one, we have this profound statement. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, you really, alethos, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but you know, you're quoting the, the Greek, truly, really, surely are my disciples. All right. If you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. So that is the qualifier. That's what I want is, I'm glad he's repeating those words. That is really the point of this whole video series. And for some reason, there's other comments being made my goal in for you and for myself and for thomas for everyone who cares is to identify in scripture who the true disciples are okay so i want to i want to take us back to where this all began and let me continue to see where his comments are right all right then he says all right then you say disciples are not a special group of super christians but anyone who claims to be a follower of christ right and I want you to listen to how he responds. I wanted to make, I said, the disciples are not a special group of super holy people, right? <laughs> uh, and you're going to see what his response is. And then this is going to be telling because I always want to go back to what the foundation of this series is and see if we're truly on course or if we're off course. Um, let me finish your, your Jesus. Jesus appears to be qualifying who the real disciples are in the midst. Those who are, who believed. All right. Now let me, you said disciples are not a special group of super Christians, but only who anyone who claims to be a follower of Christ. Right. I would say no, I, uh, because all right, Jesus Christ says, go therefore and make disciples of people of all the nations you know, baptizing them in the name of the father, son, and the Holy, Holy spirit. Uh, so a disciple is a follower of Christ, a believer. A disciple is a follower of Christ, a believer. You heard those words, right? 
a disciple from Thomas. I'm not putting words in his mouth. A disciple is a follower of God, a believer. That's how he defined it. So now we have a definition. And the, 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 the goal is we need to make sure that definition, whatever that definition is, matches what scripture says. And I'm, I'm going back to the verse that led this whole discussion, right? Back and forth. John 8, 31. If you abide in my word, you are truly disciples of mine. That's Jesus giving us and everyone who cares to listen his qualifications, his requirements, his necessary condition that must be met in order for you to be considered a disciple of Jesus Christ. One who um, yeah, b believes on Jesus Christ. Uh, one who, can, who, who believes in their heart. Okay. Notice what he says. They believe from the heart. I'm just going back. They believe from the heart. I, you know, I'm not picking on Thomas. I'm just saying that I wanted him to define who the disciple was. And I'm in agreement with that. I'm in agreement with that definition. Now, the thing is, I'm in agreement with it, not because Thomas said it. I'm in agreement with it because I believe that's what scripture teaches. Jesus gave us the definition, John 8, 31. Okay. And all I sought to do from the very beginning was to honor Jesus's words. And so whenever I saw an attribute of someone that did not fit what Jesus said, I threw them out the window, you know, metaphorically speaking, right? Didn't really throw anybody out the window. Hope not. But uh, the point is, is that I discarded anything that did not line up with Jesus's requirements. So we have two things. They, 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 they abide in his word, right? And he said they believe from the heart, which I think is essential, right? No one would disagree with that. Believes in their heart on Jesus Christ and then confesses. So they, they, um, that's what a disciple is. All right. That is what a disciple is. You hear that definition? Now, the thing is, I don't want, and this is really important, everyone. I am not putting words in Thomas's mouth. I'm not forcing him to say that. I'm not some person manipulating him. He's not a puppet on a string with some strings. I'm not doing that. He is speaking on his own accord. And I asked a very simple question because I think anytime you have a discussion, we need to define our terms. And the reason why I'm going back to this initial video is because I think a lot of these response videos where we're going back and forth fails to consider the starting point. I want to go back to the starting point because I, I think in a lot of the responses from Thomas's side, and I have I respect for him. Thomas, I respect you, man. And I'm only saying this because I do respect you. And I want to make sure that you understand uh, where we started so we can make sure we're on the same page. Does that make sense? And so I, I, you know, I have profound respect for you. That's why I'm going back to what you said, because I care about what you said. Your words matter to me and they should matter to you and they should matter to everyone who's listening. So he's already defined that. Now, here's where it gets interesting. I think I think he's going to say something where he pivots. I'm not sure. I don't want to put words in his mouth. Let's let's listen. A believer, a believer, when he once he believes in his heart, the gospel he receives the Holy Spirit. He receives the Holy Spirit. I believe that. I believe that. I believe scripture teaches that, right? I think Ephesians chapter one speaks to that, right? He receives the Holy Spirit and sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise after he believes. We're on, we're on one accord. Okay, now that's not saying that he's going to continue. Now there's the problem. Did you did you hear that? It's not saying he's going to continue, and that's where the whole ship gets capsized, right? Is that we start with a definition where Jesus says, if, if you abide in my word, truly you're disciples of mine, and we have, you're believing from the heart, you're a disciple, he, he, he defines a disciple as someone who's not a special, super type of holy believer, but they are a believer, and then he changes the definition, or he does something where he pivots and say, well, they they believe, but they won't always believe. So what what we need to talk about, ladies and gentlemen, is a disciple. Anything else that we might bring up is really irrelevant to the conversation. 
and, and what I what I feel has happened and why I'm making this video is that I feel like a lot of what's been discussed uh, in the back and forth, uh, unfortunately, has veered off course. We have gone into the deep, murky end of the water where we're talking about things are, that are not really disciples anymore. And it's obfuscating the question, the question that everyone needs to know. And I think this is important. If you're listening to this video and you're like, hey, I, I read my Bible, I believe I have faith, whatever. I, you need to be certain if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, and I think that's a relevant question to ask, especially in the day and age in which we live, where so much false doctrine and teaching is uh, proliferating and a lot of it's coming right out of churches, so-called churches. And it's being uh, propagated and proliferated and it's being spread all over social media and everyone, no one's checking. And we're in an age where people are biblically illiterate. So I think it's important that, that we define our terms and we define our terms based on scripture. Uh, and so Thomas, if you're hearing this, this is not a get, this is not a gotcha. I'm not, that's not my goal. My goal is to make sure that we are consistent with our presentation, right? So here's what I want to do. Uh, I want to address something he mentioned in the most recent video. So I'm going to switch gears for a moment and I'm going to bring something up because he, he did put together a, a recent response video and I want to bring that out. Um, about, I think it's about the one about holding fast. I think that might be the one that he brought up. I want to bring out. So let's go ahead and play this video. And I, I want what I want to do, he's going to talk about first Corinthians, uh, chapter 15, because I did make a video. I think my part two video where I made a point about first Corinthians chapter 15. I think he felt that I contradicted myself or didn't really explain well. Uh, um, I think it was, uh, the word to hold fast is where I referenced that, uh, in first Corinthians chapter 15. But I think what we need to do, I think this is going to be a good education for all of us. Cause I think what we need to do is take time to look at that scripture, because I, I think if we, uh, carefully look at that passage in light of what, uh, the parable of the sower says, namely what I think in Mark's account, um, I think that that will be telling. So let's just go ahead and, and, and play his comments and then I'll respond quickly. Actually, what I want to do is want, I want to actually want to address two things, but I'll, I'll address 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15 first. Let's play his comments. Hello, Rick. I just watched your second video on uh, who are Christ's disciples. All right, and very briefly, what I want to say to you, in that video, you actually disproved the point that you were attempting to make. Uh, I wrote down notes at each timestamp where uh, I saw things, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna even address all of that. What I'm gonna do is just show you just from uh, the the three scriptures that you quoted or that you used uh, regarding holding fast that word which they received. Okay, and when you went to First Corinthians chapter fifteen, you misapplied that scripture. As far as you, you, what you said was that the scripture was proving that these were individuals who were holding fast that that word which they received. No, that's not what First Corinthians fifteen one and two said. It said, "If you hold fast the word, otherwise you believed in vain." You didn't even finish reading that because if you had finished reading that, your point would have been disproved. I'm just going to show you, show you here, uh, Luke chapter eight. Well, before we get to Luke, before we get to Luke, let's deal with first Corinthians chapter 15. Okay. So I think this is important. He said, well, uh, me quoting that and finish it. And my point wasn't actually to read the whole, uh, chapter. My point was to actually make reference to, uh, the same Greek word for holding fast being referenced there being applied to believers. And he's saying, well, I didn't, if I had finished the verse, I actually would have disproven my point. Let's see if that's actually true. So that's going to, let's, let's actually go there. So I'm actually going to pull up first Corinthians chapter 15 and let's take a look at that real quick. First Corinthians chapter 15. So Paul, give you some background here. Paul is dealing with the issue of the resurrected Christ. There are individuals who uh, don't believe that Jesus Christ, the resurrection is real. 
And what Paul is addressing is the uh, necessity to actually believe in the resurrected Christ. And uh, later on in this very chapter, he's going to deal uh, with arguments and, so, and show the, um, how problematic the arguments are if someone says that you, you don't have to believe in the resurrected Christ how that will end up being detrimental to the person that holds that stance. Nonetheless, I want to address 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 1, and I'm going to end at verse 2 uh, to make my point. So it says, Now I make it known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved. And this is the point of contention where the uh, conditional statements brought in, starting with the... Uh, 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 if statement, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. Okay, so the issue here is, see, I think what he's probably focusing on is that, see, you have to, you have to hold fast. It's a condition. That's right. I, I believe that. That's why I went to this verse, because only those in reference to the parable of the sower. The, the, who are the good soul actually do hold fast. So they actually meet the qualification. That's why I went to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to demonstrate that someone meets the qualification. Now I think where uh, Thomas may be getting tripped up a little bit is this last part, unless you believed in vain. And I think this is important that we understand that we understand that the word believe there is also prestuo. And one of the things that um, and he didn't bring this out in the video that he just made, but there's been, there was an exchange I had with Thomas in comments where he basically responded. And he had prostuo referenced in multiple verses and he had it uh, in all caps. And I responded saying, so what? Because context determines meaning just because you have prostuo uh, in a verse doesn't mean that is uh, that belief is being represented in a positive light. And this is an example where belief is not actually being represented in a positive light. In this instance, it's saying believed in vain. In vain here is actually an adverb. And we know that adverbs modify verbs. So in this case, what it's saying is not actually qualifying and saying this person actually ever believed. It's saying this person believed vainly or they have a vain belief. Now think about that. What does a vain belief mean? It means that this is a superficial belief. This person may actually believe in some orthodox orthodoxy in, re, in regards to Christ, but they have no love, affection, no trust for Christ. Versus the ones who hold fast, who are the very ones who received and received in, in the way they've taken the word close to them and which they stand, right? And which they also are going to be saved. These are the ones who hold fast. These are the ones who actually are the good soil versus the ones who are the ones who believed in vain, which is not belief at all. It's superficial belief. That's the whole idea here. If you're getting tripped up when you see the word believed, you also need to look at that word in context and look at the fact that believed is being modified by the adverb vain. And when you put these two things together, it's not saying that this person actually had any substantive belief they had a shallow belief this belief that they had uh, didn't elevate itself to anything that would qualify itself as saving faith and that's the whole idea here is that the only one being saved here is those who hold fast right and so i want to bring that point out it actually fits the point i was making back in mark chapter four so if i go back to mark chapter four uh, I believe this is the one I want to go to is notice in Mark chapter four. Let me actually make this a little bigger for you. In Mark chapter four, verse 16, when it talks about the ones where uh, it uh, fell, the seed that fell along the uh, rocky places, right? The rocky places. Notice in verse 16, in a similar way, homoesis, that's the Greek word, homoesis, in a similar way, Similar way to what? He never addressed that in his response video because I think he realizes that this is a very incriminating statement Jesus is making. He said, well, Jesus said this person believed in Luke's account. Yes, but Jesus also said in Mark's account that in a similar way and similar to what? 
and similar to the situation where Satan came and took away the word which had been sown in them. He said, in a similar way, these ones in whom the seed was sown on the rocky place, who when they heard the word, immediately received it with joy, and they had no firm root or no root in themselves, but are only temporary. So we're talking about this temporary faith, which Jesus in these Mark accounts doesn't give it any positive uh, um, um, uh, comment made in regards to that. He's actually saying in a similar way to the very same situation where Satan came and took away the word. That's what's being expressed here, which is why. Why is that the case? Because it's a shallow, superficial faith. And how do we know it's a shallow and superficial faith? It's because... When persecution came, when they actually had to stand on their faith, what happened? They got up and kicked, put their tail behind them and got out of Dodge. That's what happened to that individual, is that when they had to stand on that faith, it was paper thin. That's how we know that the faith they had was worthless, ultimately worthless. So I wanted to bring that out. I think it's really important that when we see words like prestuo in text, that we also look at the context and the way that's being used. And it, it perfectly fits, ladies and gentlemen, it perfectly fits the way Jesus describes uh, the nature of this faith, okay? Remember also, Thomas said in his comment that it's about believing in your heart, believing in your heart. Yes, I believe that, and I agree. That's why in the Luke account, go back to Luke chapter 8, verse 15, right? He says, but the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in a good, an, I'm sorry, in an honest and good heart, and hold fast, hold it fast. That's why I was referencing 1 Corinthians chapter 15. They meet the qualifications because they hold it fast. In fact, they're the only ones that meet those qualifications, right? We've already ruled out the reference to believing it believed in vain in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as being a shallow, uh, uh, superficial faith. So we've we've already uh, bear, bore witness to Jesus's commentary on the nature of that faith and comparing it to Satan coming and taking the word from the people, right? So we see that there, all right? And um, what else do I wanna bring out? I wanna bring out one other quick comment and then I'm done. Uh, the reference that he made, he it was, it was like verse salad. He I noticed that um, Thomas just started just reciting a bunch of Bible verses, didn't really exegete those verses, just was going from verse to verse to verse to verse to verse. One thing I want to bring out real quick. I, well, actually, let me bring out two things. I want to jump to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I'll just pull up here. Okay. And so he Thomas uses the scripture a lot. I believe the scripture. So first of all, I affirm the scripture. Uh, this, is, this is a scripture we all need to heed. It says, but the Spirit express, uh, spre uh, uh, explicitly says that in the later times, some will fall away from the faith. Now, the emphasis I want to focus on here is the faith. We'll come back to that. Paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. All right. And so I want to focus on that verse. So uh, Thomas, Thomas's comment, well, see, only believers can fall away from the faith. That's talking about believers. So first of all, what we need to do is define our terms. We need to define what does it mean by the faith, all right? So it's the Greek word pistos here. It's not prestuo, it's not the verb to believe, it's the belief, all right? And notice what in uh, 1 Timothy 4 is doing. It's comparing the faith to something else. Notice, let me read the verse again. But the spirit, uh, explicitly says that in the later times, some will fall away from the faith. And how do they do that? So how do they fall away? So you actually have this verb or this, what's called a verbal par participle that explains how they go about falling away from the faith, paying heed or uh, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. That's how they fall away, okay? So what I said before, the word here, the Greek word for faith is the word pistos. So pistos, I actually have it pulled up here so you can see it. Uh, actually, let me go to it. Pistos. 
Do I have it? Yeah, here we go. Pistis. Here it can be faith, belief, firm persuasion. But this is a noun, not a verb. This is not an action that someone do is doing. In fact, if you go to, let's pull up a, a scripture real quick, a good scripture to reference, to think about. Jude chapter 3. Let's go to Jude 3. Jude 3 says, Belo uh, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt it necessary, felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith. For what? What's this word? Pistus, right? Which was once for all handed down to the saints. So this is something given to the saints, handed down. So we're giving clue here. So what, what does it mean it was handed down? This is the, the teaching handed down from Christ and the apostles. That's what this peace this this is belief is talking about it was handed down we should earnestly contend for the truth that has been given to us the word of the cross the message of truth uh the the word of reconciliation different words throughout scripture uh the word of truth different words given that is what we should be earnestly contending for that okay so that is what's being referenced when when it's being referred to back in first timothy chapter four that's what what Paul is talking about here. Now, remember the question is, believe, only believers can fall away from the faith. But here's the thing. In this very verse, believers are not identified. But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away. We, we are not given the identification of the some. So it's presumptuous to say that some are believers. When the text doesn't say they are believers, we're, we're actually adding something here that the text doesn't actually present. What I want to do lastly is I believe that scripture does tell us uh, who these individuals are. And I believe what we need to do is prosecute the case. And I'm, this is the last point I will make. Going to 1 John chapter 2. And what I will do when I go to 1 John chapter 2 is I will not just jump to a verse. Uh, one of the things that I detest is when people just jump to a verse and don't give you any context and say, see, this verse means X, Y, and Z. So I want to give you some background. Um, this verse is, I think it's going to be telling. So let me read John, John the Apostle's uh, words. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not ours only, but also those of the whole world. Goes on to say, by this we know that we have come to know him. Okay? If we keep his commands, commandments. Now, this verse, as I go through, I'm going to make some quick comments. This verb, this verb know, is in perfect tense. That means something that happened in the past with ongoing present results. So you knew him and you know him now. Okay? I'm going to be making some points as I go through this text and to get to my main point, okay? Verse four, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. So John is identifying who is, who is true and who is a liar. The one who, does, who's, who says, I have come to know him, says, hey, I know him, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar. I want you to remember that word liar. And the truth is not in him, but whoever keeps the word. Remember the whole idea that the whole discussion has been about abiding in his word. Jesus said, John 8, 31, if you abide in my word, truly you are disciples of mine. So this is, speaks to who the true disciples are. So this is a relevant text. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of the father has truly been perfected. By this, we know that we are in him. The one who says that he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walks. So what th John's saying, there's going to be people that say, hey, I abide in him. Well, there needs to be proof of that. That's what he said. That's what he's saying here. He ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. And then, then he switches to the believers. How do we know that? 
He starts in verse 7 by saying, Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you. So focus on the pronouns. In fact, I should get a t-shirt that says pronouns matter because they do matter. I think it's important as we prosecute the case. Verse 7, Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. Okay? Heard that in the past. And and the other on the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is, is already shining. The one who says he is in the light, yet hates his brother, is in darkness until now. So we're qualifying statements. Who is in the light? Who is in darkness? Well, the one who hates his brother is still in the darkness, okay? The one who loves his brother abides in the light. Look at that. Abide is abiding here. Abides in the light. And there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven. And I like this forgiven text here. That verb forgiven talks about something that has done, been done in the past with present results. That's important. That's important that we know that because we have our advocate and our propitiation, Jesus Christ the righteous. Those believers have that. That's why he can make that statement. And that's why this tense of verb Present tense, uh, pre present tense verb is being used, okay? Forgiving you for his name's sake. Verse 13, I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him. And notice that know him is also perfect tense, meaning you knew him in the past and you continue to demonstrate you know him now in the present. Know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. You have overcome in the past, perfect tense, and you still demonstrate that you overcome him in the present. That's why it's perfect tense verb. I have written to you, children, because you know. Know there is in perfect tense. You knew him in the past, and you continue to know him now, the father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the evil one. Overcome again is in perfect tense. You overcome in the past. And there's, there's evidence of you overcoming the evil one in present. Okay? You see that? So he's affirming the nature and the characteristics of true believers. You see that? Versus those who say, hey, I, I, I'm in him. I believe him. Right? Uh, uh, John just said that person's a liar. Okay? Let's keep going. Verse 15. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world. Now notice what he does. This is important. He switches from beloved in verse 15. He switches from you and then he uses a generic anyone. He's now making a case about what the implications are if you love the world. Right? He's already, he's already showed us earlier the character of those believers he's writing to. He says, you don't love the things of the world. You abide in God's word. You love the brethren, right? You, that, that's already been affirmed, okay? So we can't throw that away. Now we get to verse 15. Do not love the world nor the things in the world, right? If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lust. But the one who does the will of, the, of God lives forever. Right? Qualifying statement there. All right? Now, verse 18. Children. Now he switches back to the children. Children. It is the last hour. It is the, it is the last hour. And just as you have heard that Antichrist is coming even now many antichrists have appeared from this we know that it is the last hour so we, now we have antichrist antichrist all right and anti means against opposed to christ do you understand so you put 
anti in Christ together, an enemy or you're opposed to Christ, right? And verse 19 starts with the pronoun they. Okay? Now, in the past, I have heard from Thomas, they are wayward believers or unbelievers, but he never exegeted the text. So why am I spending all this time reading all these verses? I'm, what I'm trying to qualify here is an important statement of truth that everyone who cares about the truth needs to hear. From the very beginning video, my question is, who, are God's, uh, who is Christ's true disciples? I gave you the words of Jesus, John 8, 31. I'm also giving you John's words, who was uh, the, 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 uh, the, the one who Jesus loved, right? As he's nicknamed, right? But he's giving us some vital information. They went out from us. Another pronoun. They went out from us. But they were not really of us. Now, remember I told you to pay a close attention to that word liar before the ones that claim to know God, but don't love, don't abide in his word. That person is called a liar, right? Well, how do we know who the liars are, right? How do we know? Well, verse 19 tells us they went out from us, but they were not really of us. Well, if something's not real, it's false. It's another way of saying it's a lie, right? We understand that. For if they had been of us, and the us is like children, the you that we saw before, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they were not all are not of us. So you have this big all. You have this big group of people saying, I abide, I, I love God. But how do we know? The proof is in the abiding, in the staying. Those who are truly God's, those who are truly abide in his word will stay. This is the line of demarcation here in verse 19, but it goes on, it goes on. But you have, now he goes switches back, but you. So we went from the they in verse 19 back to the you in verse 20. So that's why it's important to follow the pronouns because we need to know who, who John's talking about. He, in verse 19, he's talking about the they, not talking about the you, not talking about the children. He's talking about the they because he made a distinction. He says, they went from us verse 20 but you now talking back to the believers have an anointing from the holy one and you all know and i have not written to you because you do not know the truth but because you do know it and it's because no lie is of the truth now we go to verse 22 remember that word liar verse 22 who is the liar but the one who denies Jesus Christ, Jesus is the Christ. And, and here's the thing, denying that Jesus is the Christ is going to be telling. I want to keep reading here. Okay, this is the Antichrist. See that? There we go. That's the they. He's, he's telling us who the they are. Let's, let's make sure we're following the argument here that John's making. Right? Notice in verse 18, he mentions Antichrist. Children, it is the last, it is the last hour. And just as you have heard that Antichrist is coming even now many antichrists have appeared right the antichrists have appeared right you see that they what's the antecedent of they antichrist that's the antecedent not wayward believers not not something some other thing we need to follow the stream of the argument okay now as we go down here i'm going to keep on following along verse 22 let's go here who is the liar that's the question. But the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ, right? Who is the liar? But the one that denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is what? The Antichrist. The one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. So remember, I believe in Romans chapter 10, verse uh, 9. That uh, let me jump there real quick. I'm going to jump back and forth, and this is my last point, which is a long point. 
And they want I didn't then intend on making a long point, uh, chapter verse nine. All right, so that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So now we've encompassed what Paul mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15. We, we encompassed what John mentioned in his epistle, and we brought that all together, and we brought it all together with confession. And so this Greek word homeo lego means to say the same thing. You're speaking the words of Christ. You're in agreement and acknowledgement to the things of Christ. Christ says this, God says this, and you're in agreement with him, right? You're speaking the same thing. You're saying the same thing. The person who's the antichrist person that's mentioned in 1 John chapter 2 does not say the same thing. Let's go back. So they're demonstrating that they're not a true disciple. They're saying one thing and they end up doing something else. They're not in agreement with God, right? Uh, let's go back. I'm going to go back to 1 John chapter 2. Uh, start right here, okay? And uh, verse 23, right? So whoever denies the Son uh, does not have the Father. The one who confesses, remember that's that same Greek word, the Son uh, has the Father also. So we need to understand confession is not just talking about agreeing to a bunch of facts. We can all agree to a bunch of facts, but in, uh, but beneath that is actually understanding when you say the Son, who is the Son? And do you also believe in the work of the Son? You're confessing and believing in the work of the Son, that he is the Son of God, that he uh, died and rose again on the third day, that He that he's the way, the truth, and the life. All the things that he taught and all the work that he did is what you're confessing to. It's actually wrapped up when you say, confess the Son, has the Father, right? That's what we just saw when we actually uh, jumped to the other verse there. Um, when I actually jumped to Romans chapter 10 there, it said that, and as for you, see, as for you, let that abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning, okay? And what you've heard from the beginning, if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life, okay? So I want to stop right there. I could keep reading, but I think I made my point. My point is we have identified what verse 19 is talking about, who he's talking about. We have identified from the very beginning. Remember, we start at the very beginning of this chapter. There are those that say, I'm aligned with Christ. I'm aligned. I'm aligned with Christ. But John affirms that this person is a liar. Later on in the same chapter, again, a liar. Why are they a liar? Because they do not abide in the word. They do not confess. That means they do not have the belief in the things that are truly uh, presented in the text of Scripture about our Lord and Savior. And they demonstrate that because they fall away. They may, can, they may say, I'm with you, but the demonstration is that it's shown uh, that they actually depart. So why do I bring this up? Why did I make take this long amount of time to talk about this? Going back to this Greek word, uh, pieces. That's referred to in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 1. The question or the statement was made, only believers can fall away, can fall away. Uh, that's what it means. Believers are the ones who fall away. What I, what I clearly showed you is that it's not talking about believers falling away. It's talking about those who may claim to believe, uh, but never were believers. They depart from the fellowship of of believers and the proclamation of the word. They have no love for it. And that's demonstrated in their departure, which fits the parable of the sower perfectly because those who claim to believe, believe for a while, but fall away, right? Those that get caught up in the pleasures of the world or where is the world that fall away. But only the good soil who took and received the word with an honest and good heart demonstrate that they are truly believers and consequently the true disciples of Jesus Christ. I hope this video was edifying and I hope it helped to explain some much needed things that need to be clarified. Um, everyone, uh, stay tuned. I'm, I'm actually going to be making a video very soon about John uh, chapter 15, which I think will be very edifying for all. Everyone have a good evening. Take care.